Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. Welcome back to Sunday Morning in the Old Cookbook Show. Today we're going to do a recipe that appears in dozens of my cookbooks from the early 1800s until about mid-World War I. Um, and we'll get to that, that change later. But in all of these cookbooks, um, there's a recipe that is generally known as genuine Italian macaroni Italian macaroni, Italian macaroni, and the one that we're going to follow most closely is this cookbook. Um, this is an original from 1883, and this is a reprint. It's always nice to have a reprint of a lot of these books. Not that you want to abuse a book, but if you're going to be thumbing through a book looking for recipes, a reprint is always better than an original. And this is an original of the Buckeye, um, Buckeye Cookery and Practical Housekeeping book. Uh, sent in by a viewer um, whose predecessor was part of bringing this to life. And I thank them very much for sending this in. So the recipe we're going to do out of this cookbook is called, again, Italian Macaroni. Um, this is from 1883. Uh, some of these books are from the 1820s. This one is from just around World War I. And before you go full Vincenzo's plate on me, um, it's not really Italian. The dish really isn't Italian. It is an American interpretation of Italian food. And it's an American interpretation. It could even be an Italian-American interpretation of what they sort of remember that they ate before they immigrated to the United States, but they're making do with what they found here. And I'm not exactly sure where this comes from, but all of the recipes are essentially the same in the way that they're put together. So I'm supposed to start out with some salt pork for the fat and then ground beef. Uh, the variation within these recipes is um, bacon or salt pork to start with. And sometimes it's ground beef, sometimes it's ground pork. The earlier you go in the recipe books, it asks for leftover beef from the Sunday roast. So whatever was left over, maybe on Wednesday or Thursday, you chop it up real fine and you put it into this dish, a uh, way to use leftovers at the end of their life. Now, I'm gonna brown this ground beef. The Buckeye Cookery book talks about putting the beef and these onions in a kettle, putting the lid on the kettle, um, Dutch oven. We'd call it today a Dutch oven, but then it would have been called a kettle. And putting it on the back burner of your wood stove and just letting it go all day. And letting it brown and, and cook slowly over an even heat from your wood stove all day. I don't have a wood stove. Um, Julie's going to be home in a little while and I don't have all day to wait to make supper. So I'm just going to brown it off quickly. Okay, that's looking pretty good. So next in are tomatoes. So pretty much all of the recipes ask for canned or stewed tomatoes. These are our home canned tomatoes from our own garden. Um, and so when you see a recipe from this time period asking for canned tomatoes, they're not necessarily asking for, you know, a can, a tin can of tomatoes um, that you would go to the grocery store today and, and buy. It would be home canned tomatoes. And a lot of them ask for stewed tomatoes. So these are stewed tomatoes. And so, you know, we get the tomatoes, bring them in from the garden, peel them, put them in a pot with some onion, celery, and some spices, stew them together, and then put them into the jars. So there's, there's a whole lot more flavor in a stewed tomato than in just a plain canned tomato. And you just saw me put some pepper in. That's really the only spice that, uh, that is asked for. Some of the recipes ask for a little bit of garlic. Um, you know, half a clove of garlic, that sort of thing. There really isn't a lot of spicing going on beyond just the flavors of the tomato, the beef, the pork, the onion. And as much as I just said that this was pretty much an American recipe because it appears in all of these, 
It also appears in a lot of English cookbooks in the same time period. And so this is the Scottish Women's Rural Institute cookery book. And it appears in even the earliest ones of, of this book that I have and through um, later books as well. I mean, this was, in the 1800s, a very popular recipe. So I'm going to let this cook down. Um, says to let it go for two hours. I've got about an hour and a half, and uh, we'll let this cook and come together. Okay, so sauce is looking good. Salted water just about up to a boil. Um, one of the other variations that I forgot to mention that, that you see in a lot of these books is the addition of a can of mushrooms. Um, the Buckeye cookery book doesn't call for any mushrooms. The Tennessee cookbook just says chopped mushrooms. Doesn't call for canned mushrooms, so I assume that they meant um, if you can get them fresh, use them fresh. All of the other cookbooks call out specifically canned mushrooms, um, which is not that strange, because even in my lifetime, Fresh mushrooms were difficult to get when I was a little kid, and my mom always used canned mushrooms because you could always have them. Fresh mushrooms were something that, you know, you found at the grocery store sometimes, but not always. Now, this is called Italian macaroni. And I have macaroni. So this is, this is full-length macaroni. Um, I get this from a store a West Indian store. Uh, it's from Trinidad. So it is macaroni. It is full length. Macaroni is a weird word. So let's talk about what a weird word macaroni is. In this time period and earlier, um, macaroni was often used as a generic word that just meant pasta. And you can see that in some of these cookbooks. The recipe will be called macaroni with and then in the recipe, it will call out for spaghetti or, you know, rotini or penne or something like that. Macaroni just meant pasta. It could have been used interchangeably for any shape of pasta. In some instances, though, it's specifically called for macaroni. And what they're asking for is this long, straight tubes of macaroni, which is what I have here. This cookbook that we're working from today doesn't really say. It just says, take a quantity of macaroni desired and boil in water for 20 minutes. Often, um, these early cookery books would ask you to either break it up before you cook it, or cook it and then cut it up into smaller lengths. I always thought that was interesting. Turns out, elbow macaroni, the macaroni that we all think of today, uh, the little short ones that are curved, isn't invented until the 1870s. So no one, well, shouldn't say that, okay, wasn't commercially available to buy until the 1870s. I'm sure some pasta granny, you know, in Italy somewhere was making or fashioning tiny little pieces of elbow macaroni, but you couldn't buy it um, commercially at a store. So elbow macaroni doesn't show up until the 1880s, which is sort of in fitting with what's going on here, but would it have been available in Ohio, um, in the American Midwest in this time period? Who knows? Okay, the water's boiling, so in goes a quantity of macaroni. I won't be cooking the pasta, the macaroni, um, for, for 20 or 25 minutes. Nine, ten minutes is probably more than enough. But I am going to move these books out of the way. Um, the next bit could be really messy and I don't want to get stuff all over these books. Now, at the same time as this recipe, Italian macaroni, um, is in this book or in, in all of these books, there's another recipe that is sort of running in parallel that we have done on this channel that shows up in a lot of cookbooks from the American South and it is called southern spaghetti. And just to be clear to those people who, you know, take exception, when I say southern spaghetti, I mean the southern United States, not Sicily. And so southern spaghetti is happening at the same time, in parallel, 
and it's it's one of those recipes that is the same thing. It's it's a casserole. It's spaghetti. It's a meat sauce. The meat sauce is um, has a little bit wider variety of flavors, and it usually had beans or peas or something in it like that. And so you can you can look on our channel and find that. And that southern spaghetti recipe is one that again I find in dozens and dozens and dozens of cookbooks from the southern United States in this time period. Now, if you're watching closely, you'll notice that I'm cooking macaroni. I've made sort of a meat sauce. I'm gonna put some cheese on top. It's gonna go into a casserole dish. It's gonna go in the oven. And you're probably saying, that's just like Johnny Marzetti. And you wouldn't be wrong. It is just like Johnny Marzetti. And so um, the restaurant where Johnny Marzetti comes from isn't established until the 1890s, I think 1896 or 97 or something like that. And historians have had a hard time nailing down when this dish showed up on their menu called Johnny Marzetti or John Marzetti. But this dish, Italian macaroni, in cookbooks from like the late 1920s and onward starts to be called Johnny Marzetti. And the Italian macaroni name falls by the wayside. The recipe expands a little bit. There are some other flavors put in, um, but for the most part, it is exactly the same recipe. And depending on what part of um, the United States or Canada that you live in, it could be called other things like American goulash or um, here my mother would have called it chop suey. And again, those are recipes that we've done on the channel as well. And so that's the thing about food. Food is not static. It does not sit still. It moves, it changes, it morphs, it evolves. And so, you know, a recipe that I see from 1820 and then you follow it through to 1920, the recipe might stay basically the same, but some of the flavors will change. Some of the ingredients will change because the way that people live has changed. And then eventually the name changes, even though it is essentially the same recipe. And so, you can't, you can't think of it as static. I'm 75 years old and I've always lived here and I don't know what you're talking about. Well, no you don't, because this is from almost 200 years ago. Okay, I'm gonna say this macaroni is cooked, so drain it out. And I'll just stick it in this bowl. Okay, so I need need a spoon. Of course, I can't grab a spoon right away. It's just a layered dish at this point. So, in this baking dish, okay, a layer of macaroni. And a layer of meat sauce. and a layer of cheese. Now the cheese is a little bit interesting. I'm using cheddar because the uh, recipe that I'm working from just said American cheese. And in this time period, it would have been cheddar, uh, American cheese. Some of the other recipes uh, specifically call out cheeses like Emmental. Uh, one of the recipes says grated Italian cheese, and that's, you know, as far as they get, they don't really say which Italian cheese. There's so many. Um, one or two of the recipes do call for you to make a cheese sauce, almost like macaroni and cheese, um, and pour that on, so like a bechamel sauce even. But most of them, most of the recipes are just this. You're layering in grated cheddar cheese, macaroni, and the meat sauce, ending up with a layer of cheese on top and sticking it in the oven. Okay, last layer of cheese. And into the oven. Okay, so we can clear these away. Hi friends. 
Um, this was last Sunday's recipe. We made uh, proto biscuits, American biscuits, Kentucky biscuits, whatever. All right, so, but we have other things to, to try out. So these cookbooks go away. So place, I'm guessing forks. These cookbooks come back. <laughs> Always lots going on. Um, you think the spoon is the right choice? Well, I don't know. So it's tongs, spoon. It's difficult to say. I feel like so I'll get tongs just in case. <laughs> so this is. Italian macaroni from the 1800s. Okay. Oh, yes, yeah, the package of macaroni that was uncut macaroni, like yeah. long macaroni. Yeah. So this is. Um, Let me it, help you out. It shows up in oh, almost every cookbook that we own from this time period. Really? Yeah. What's like, the time period again? Uh, this is this is early 1800s to the 1880s, even into the 1910s, and then. The recipe changes name. <laughs> tongs. Yeah, tongs, tongs would have been better. The recipe changes name um, at some point and becomes Johnny Marzetti. It becomes uh, American goulash. It becomes chow mein. It's noodles and yeah. looks like noodles, meat, cheese, tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> looks like it still might be hot, though. You know what I mean? It's a great combination. Ooh. I used our stew, stewed tomatoes because mm -hmm. some of these recipes ask for canned tomatoes and some of them ask for stewed tomatoes. Stewed tomatoes just bring that extra layer of flavor since there's not too many flavorings in it other than pepper. Right? Um, there's no salt in it. No. Yeah, no. You could do with some salt. A little salt. Mm -hmm. I think a little salt would be helpful. I um, <clears throat> would add more vegetables. <laughs> But you know. Mm -hmm. oh. And we talked about that. There is a, there's a recipe in parallel called Southern Spaghetti that's in all of the Southern cookbooks mm -hmm. that has beans and peas. And we did that on the show as well. It's essentially the same sort of thing, but with beans and peas. The fun thing with pasta, generally, is that you can put in whatever vegetables you got going. Like if, yeah. you, if you've got your garden and you've got some squash and you've got, just throw it in. Just, yeah, don't, don't think too much about it add what you like. Mm. So this was obviously by the number of cookbooks that it's in and the fact that the recipe isn't too different between cookbooks in this time period was a very popular dish. I wonder how easy or difficult it was to get hold of the macaroni because it would travel well. Yeah. In its um, way, right. So I have I have some cookbooks from American pasta manufacturers dried pasta in this time period. And they were selling the, the full length macaroni. So it would have been fairly easy to get. Um, and then sometime after- Because it, it's not easy to get anymore. No, well, there's, <laughs> there's the thing. So the elbow macaroni, and I said this earlier, the elbow macaroni doesn't appear in the marketplace for sale, commercially made, until 1876. Yeah. So by 1890 or 1900, that would have been available pretty much everywhere as well. Anyway, enough talking. This is a great dish and it's, it's easy to put together, relatively inexpensive, filling, put some beans in it, put some other vegetables in it, extend it any way you like. I've already picked out a wine to go with it. Okay, there you so go. thanks for stopping by. See you again soon. Woo! <laughs>